All right, and we are live. Uh, so this is the first uh, Beyond the Escape uh, webcast that uh, we're doing. Uh, I'm Michael Blachik, uh, artist, costumer, creator of the Saga Born role-playing game. And my companion is? Uh, Dane Collins, I uh, am a writer and co-creator of uh, the Saga Born world, the uh, world of Euteria and Athelies. And uh, uh, this is our first one, so I want to point out that uh, we don't exactly know what we're doing here, but we're going to do our best, and uh, I think as we go, we'll get better at these. So, All right, so uh, since it's our first one, I have to ask you, Danny, uh, what, what do you want to do with this webcast? Well, I'll tell you what I don't want to do. Uh, one, one thing that we've um, uh, talked about is doing a uh, uh, sort of a, an ongoing to do about what we do at, uh, with, uh, with our world. And, I, and I'd like to really expand out from that. I, I don't want it to be a marketing uh, tool solely. Obviously, we want to promote Sagaborn. We want to promote our products. Uh, but what I look forward to is, and we've discussed this, uh, when we're in a car to go together riding to a, to a convention, uh, we start brainstorming and, and we start coming up with good ideas. And what I'd like to do is, is give people a window into that process. Uh, you and I having a conversation, we'll have guests on and we'll have conversations with them. Uh, we'll try to make it creative. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think one thing I've gathered from panels that we've had is people are very interested in the creative process and, and what is it that we go through when we create our world, when we, uh, put all of this together and we can describe that or we can give an example of that or we can do both and uh that's what i'm looking forward to doing here uh, what about you yeah uh pretty much the same thing i mean i i feel that when we're traveling uh or when i'm traveling and i call you up uh, uh we talk for hours about everything and it may start as something as simple as here's a creature i want to put in a story what do you think of this and uh and then we start complaining about creatures we don't like, and then we talk about creatures we do like, and uh, sometimes we might not talk about the creatures at all, but then we'll come back around in the end, and normally there's something there. There's some little nugget at the end that sort of like makes the question I had, like answers it in some way or pushes me in the right direction. Um, so basically what, what I thought was when other people are traveling with me, they keep talking about how it's really interesting to listen to us. And I was like, well, then, maybe we should put this out there and see what other people think um so so yeah that was my my main thing is just to see how how our conversations go in a web dialogue like this right and 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 by the way uh one thing i've realized about that process is um a lot of times and you know i wonder if this is if this really is the the essence of the power of collaboration is if you give me an idea, you say, I have this idea for a creature. You might have a picture of what that thing is in your head, but when you give me the basics of it, I don't necessarily right away have that same picture. So I have to ask questions. And it seems like that's the process that ends up happening. You will say an idea and I'll start asking questions. Uh, you know, what about its environment? What, how does it interact with its environment? Well, what, what other creatures are, is it surrounded by? What, uh, how does it interact with those? What conflicts does it have? And, and, and so forth. And it's that process I've noticed, just that, just ask, just me trying to wrap my head around your idea that it seems like leads to us uh, 
you know, because then by you having to answer those questions, you a lot of times you didn't think about that aspect. And that's where things really start to come together. So uh, that's something that I can imagine happening live. Right. Now, I, uh, I think I also, when I call you up, I often want to almost like sell you the idea too. So, um, I, and, and I don't know what it's like to work alone. I love working, uh, you know, with, with partners or with groups of people so much that I'm not used to just sort of going in my cave and, and working alone. So I've gotten so used to getting an idea and going to someone and basically saying, this is why I think it's good. Um, and so just having someone else I'm bouncing ideas off of, I feel like might give a little bit more depth from the very start instead of just like writing it off like, oh, this is the easiest way to make this happen. Instead, it's like, well, if I have to talk to, to Danny about this, how is he going to, you know, view it? What's he going to think? Um, so I think I, even just just by me having someone to talk to has, has made me uh, think a little bit deeper on any idea that I propose to you. Yeah, you know, that's interesting too. And, and, and so the listeners understand, uh, Mike created uh, the world initially and uh, he created it many, many years ago and brought me in at a later stage when he wanted to start making it uh, into a product as opposed to a world he was building on his own uh, for gaming and, and, and so forth. So, uh, so Mike, I, uh, when, when, when you brought me into that, that was something that I had to adjust to because my creative process has always very much been me and my, you know, I'm very introverted, me and my own world exploring ideas. And, um, uh, when I made, uh, you know, I always, I'm also a musician and when I made music, there was a time when I did get collaborative and I was actually pretty good at just letting the reins go for a while. So, you know, I'd have somebody who would make beats for me and I would just let them like, cause I wanted, you know, use your imagination. I'm not going to restrict you, uh, just go nuts. And, but then I, it always came back to me and I had the, I had the, the, the final say and could, and could shape the music into a final product that I that that fit my vision, and uh, work coming into something that at the time it wasn't my world, and I was very conscious of that in the beginning. It took some time for me to feel like I even owned it in any way, and so I think I projected my mindset onto you and didn't want to step on any toes. So I was really careful, and if you remember, we weren't very productive in the beginning either. Um, or at least I was not very productive. And it was partly for that reason, because I couldn't take this and own it. I couldn't, if I came up with an idea, a lot of times it conflicted. Um, but over time, the process that we just discussed, you know, I learned the value in that, just this, this back and forth. And we came up with ideas that neither one of us ever would have had on our own. So it's it's been a for me I guess my point is it's been a very enlightening process and a it's it's changed my creative flow in a in a pretty profound way. Uh, I I'd actually say that you you were helping write it write it a long time ago you just didn't know it because I'd bring up things and talk to you about it you just didn't know I was taking notes on everything you said. Right. Mm. But uh, I also realized maybe people watching this don't know actually what we're doing. Uh, so I think uh, I should do a brief rundown sort of of the projects that we have going on. Yeah. Um, so all this started, uh, well, a long time ago when me and you would do role-playing games together. And I started putting together a world and doing art in it. Um, and for a long time, uh, as my focus turned to becoming a professional artist, that world just informed some of my artwork and, and people come in and buy some of my work and they'd be like, well, you know, who is Jarek, the wild elf druid? And why am I buying a, a drawing of him? And, you know, I'd tell him it's from my writing and that I don't let people see it. Um, but I realized that it would be uh, much neater for people who bought my art to know the stories behind it. Uh, so I started putting some stuff out and people started really liking it. 
Um, and so I, I originally did a, uh, I started a book online uh, and that was going well, but it, it wasn't catching right. Um, I, I was having a hard time figuring out how to make it my own. Um, and back then, Danny, I'd still call you and, and we'd talk even way back then. I remember coming back from Chattacom and calling you up and being like, oh, I'm going to write this book and it's about an elf and, and this and that. And, you know, even back then you're like, oh, well, what, what if you did this? Or what if you did that? So uh, you have always been there. Um, but from there, we decided to do where I decided to get into gaming uh, because I like the marriage of art, at, you know, and, and word when it comes to gaming. Like those two are hand in hand for selling a book. Um, so we started uh, the World of Euteria, which is a Pathfinder uh, series. Uh, we start out with the Elves of Euteria, uh, which I think was was a really great first collaborative project. So we're working on different cultures. We're working on uh, bringing in other artists and seeing how all that works. We're also uh, sort of struggling to see how we work together. Um, and I, I feel, you know, that that we ended up with a really strong uh, prod, uh, product there. After that, uh, we did the start design the Sagaborn uh, role playing game, which is uh, a little over a year ago. Um, and that was, we realized that we liked the writing and we liked the art, but we weren't so big on the uh, on the massive amount of rules that were in Pathfinder. So um, I started doing that, and then you started focusing more on. Uh, your novel, which is also set in the same world. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. And uh, and then I continue to, to do art within the world. So when, when we're talking about what we do, these are all the things. It's, it's not just art. It's not just books. It's like books, role-playing games, uh, you know, even, even just some like little side projects like miniatures and stuff that we've started doing. So that's I guess when we talk about what what we what we uh, I hate to say what we don't want to sell, but what you're talking about earlier that this is not just product placement for that, but that is what made us want to do this podcast was us working on this stuff uh, and, and the journey that it's taken us on. Um, so I I mean and, and even when we have our discussions like like we've talked about with traveling, even though it's about this world it always encompasses much more than that you know um whether it's arguing about like a tv show that we don't like uh and, you know and it somehow pertains or uh just talking about a piece of art that we saw at a convention that that really moved us you know um so speaking of that uh i was going to ask uh what what all have you done this week, Danny? What have you done for the worlds of Sagaborn? Um, well, honestly, this has been a slow week. Uh, we we did a, a Liberty Con just a week ago, and uh, uh, which, by the way, had a had a had a great time, and I think we should talk about that here in a bit also because uh, we did have a play test. Uh, I came back and I've been doing a lot of catching up. I've been working on the book. Um, the uh, the novel is in its final stages of a second draft. There will be a third draft before I can send it off to an editor. Um, but but first draft was done a while back. Second draft, it turns out, uh, editing a longer novel is 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 harder even than I expected. So um, so so I put a lot of work into that. There's also um, uh, we've had some discussions this week about uh, some monster creation, um, uh, which was an interesting discussion in itself. Uh, if 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 we don't want a clockwork creature in our world, how do we feel about a creature that's that feels like a clockwork creature, even though it's technically not? Um, and uh, you know, I think that I think that. I think that covers it for this week. I know you've been busy though, because you have uh, 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 stuff with the uh, with the rules and PC gen and so forth. Yeah, well, everything at this point. Uh, I'm going to Detroit for a week, but everything is about Gen Con at this point. Um, 
you know, I'm going to have a big art display there. I'm going to be, uh, you know, selling books, selling dice. Uh, but the big thing is we're going to try to release the Sagaborn RPG beta there. Um, the design uh, uh, for the interior should be in later tonight, which means I can get off to the publisher. So I'm cutting it very close, only two weeks, but Ingram is pretty fast. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping it goes over well. I'm not running any demos, sadly. Being in the dealer's hall means I don't have as much time to go in the game room. But I will be showing demos at the table, um, which I am a bad businessman. I don't have our table number, um, but that'll be in the links uh, on YouTube afterwards. But um, I'll be set up with Aridani Studios, uh, which is my other company. Um, so, so I'll be demoing stuff and I'll be selling stuff uh, for cheap. Uh, the the rule book should only be ten dollars, um, and. Uh, and yeah, it's just all packing, getting organized, doing stuff like making sure I have all the right banners or, uh, you know, postcards, all the stuff that you need for a big convention that someone as unorganized as me is not good at coming up with. Um, I haven't, uh, I'm not as active on the con circuit as you are. Um, when, when you do one of these, how difficult would it be to recruit people to run play tests on our behalf? Uh, I've, I've done it in the past. Um, it was easier when we were selling Pathfinder books because people know the Pathfinder systems, so not to find people who know this rule system and are confident enough to go out and run it. Um, and, and a lot of it is, is organizing it. Um, and, you know, it's it's pretty hard, like, you know, I mean, when when you're traveling to the shows and you're writing the books and you're ordering the stuff, you know, and doing all the promotion, it's pretty hard to, like, juggle all those things. Um, and I also always bite off more than I can chew. Um, in fact, the, the weekend before uh, Gen Con, I'm doing a, a, a new thing here in Nashville called uh, Drinking Dungeon. Uh, which I'm doing with Rob Schwab, uh, who uh, created a Tales of the Demon Lord or Shadows of the Demon Lord, and uh, it's it's going to be we're taking over a local restaurant, in Murfreesboro. We're going to be drinking beer, running games all night. Uh, I'm hoping to uh, you know play some cool like fantasy metal in the background, play some old '80s uh, fantasy movies uh, while it's going on. So it's sort of like an event, not just a bunch of people play testing stuff. Um, but I. You know, because I like to do everything and, and don't believe in sleeping, I'm literally doing this thing the weekend before Gen Con, um, at, which is only one, one and a half weeks from now. So it's, you know, everything's basically always nonstop. Um, but I think once the beta book is out, I'm going to try to find a better core of people go to conventions and have them start running demos for me. And also uh, with things like Roll20, uh, doing, doing it so that way people can run the demos online, where basically I give them maps and give them the story, and all they have to do is run the game. Um, and I have a couple uh, people who are interested in doing it. I just haven't solidified the plans at all. Um, you know, it's something that uh, uh, we could consider on the East Coast also, since... Uh, uh, and so the listeners know Mike lives in the mid south in Tennessee. I live in New Jersey, uh, Philadelphia area, and um, uh, that's part of why it's hard for me to be as active in the con circuit because Mike does uh, all of the cons with uh, uh, with his other company, uh, Aridani, uh, which he does with his family business. So he's able to uh, combine efforts to some degree. Uh, but we don't do anything on the East Coast. Now, I don't, I don't know what the possibilities would be because I don't have the con experience other than going to one a year. But, um, but it's something that uh, could be considered. Oh, I'd be really interested. I was already thinking to maybe have you start looking, uh, you know, up north for conventions that were within traveling distance to you. Um, you know, especially if it's one that maybe you could come home to you know, at nights, that way it's not like a big uh, investment, you know, it's just like show up, 
be on some panels, um, promote the books a little bit. Um, but I, I haven't even begun to do any research on that uh, at the moment. Um, but while we're talking about conventions and Liberty Con is uh, fresh on your mind, tell me, what, what did you think of the convention? So I've been to a few. Um, well, I've been to several, uh, but this is the first one that I felt to this degree that um, that I felt quite this welcome. And maybe it's because I've I had previously spent time with uh, with the organizers, uh, so they knew me and 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 definitely went out of their way to make me feel welcome. But it also felt like that was the general consensus among everybody. So I really really appreciate uh, uh, them for, for the effort they put in into that. Uh, you know, I told them that it, all of these things, every, every one of these is commercial at its core. You know, the whole idea is to bring people in to help promote their products and make money. But this, this one definitely felt a lot less commercial in tone. You know, it felt like a big, like a big, well, they, they described it like a big family reunion. Um, and, and I can see that everybody was just having a good time. And, um, um, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. And, and I think it was, it was, uh, productive for us. Well, they're, uh, they're actually a, a nonprofit. So every, I, I understand they are, but the, but all of the attendees coming or all the, I'm, I'm sorry, all of the, the, the guests and the exhibitors. And, and stuff. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean that, that there wouldn't be a, a convention without that. So that's that's the point I'm making that that there is a core of of, of, uh, of that that that's involved in selling things that I didn't even though it happens there and actually they raised a lot of money. Um, a lot of money went to, to, to charities, but that did involve selling for charity. Um, but it just didn't feel very um, commercial. It felt like a bunch of people getting together and, 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 and I don't know, maybe that's not so unusual. I, uh, you know, I think I've been to a total of six or seven different cons and right. I've never, I don't think I've ever been to anyone more than twice or more than once. Yeah. I mean, and that's definitely the feel that they're going for with Liberty Con. Like up until just recently, uh, they, uh, when I was going, at least they didn't even have a dealer's room. Uh, they had the old school uh, hucksters rooms, which meant that there is a hallway in the hotel where all the hotel rooms were dealers selling stuff out of their bedrooms. Um, so if you want to talk like, you know, in, in the first time I went to Liberty Con, I was like, this is the strangest thing to walk into someone's bedroom to see their wares. And like, you know, they set it up to look like really fancy, you know, like, there's grid wall and displays and people had like bookcases out on the bed. Um, and, and actually we did that one year, uh, but uh, it, it, it was a little odd having people come into our room, you know, and then, you know, in the middle of the day, if you had to use the bathroom, then all of a sudden your huckster room smelled really bad. Uh, right. True story. Uh, but, uh, so anyways, I think they've always promoted that they have a cutoff uh, of the, um, they don't want it to grow any more than the 750 people that they allow, except for, I think, professionals who come back. So like, if the show's sold out, but like Todd Lockwood wants to come back again, I'm sure they would find him a badge. Um, but, th and you have those people coming back. I mean, uh, Todd McCaffrey uh, cooked you crepes. Uh, That's right. Um, let's see. Steve Jackson was at our dance party. Um, I, I have photos, they're blurry, but of both Todd Lockwood and Steve Jackson dancing at the same time, like at our dance party, which pretty much makes that like, you know, uh, uh, fandom royalty uh, dance party there, you know. It doesn't get any nerdier than that. Right. Well, the, the, the highlight, though, obviously for us at least, was... Uh our play test and um uh that is and again i don't I'm, i don't get to be there for a lot of the play testing that you do out in, in in tennessee so um so i got to see 
firsthand for the first time in a little while, at least. I mean, we've done a couple of play tests online. It's not quite the same. I, I do enjoy that we can do that online. Um, of course, getting a group of uh, grown men and, 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 and women, hopefully, but ours happen to be all men, uh, together is a feat in itself. Getting that same group back together again for session number two seems to be nearly impossible. So, uh, so yeah, it, doing it in person and, and, and getting to see that was, uh, was great. I, and, and I thought it went really well. Uh, and obviously everybody that we play tested with had a good time. Yeah. Uh, that trying to get your group back together is like that one cartoon, like, what do we want? We want a game. When do you want to do it? Monday. Oh, actually I'm busy on Monday. Can we do it on Wednesday? Oh no, Wednesday's out. You know, like, that, right. That cartoon strikes such a chord. Um, as far as our play test, yeah, actually, LibertyCon was uh, a really good one. Uh, there is the one guy who had never played before, and mm. uh, his play style was very. By the way, never played an RPG to be. An clear. RPG, yeah. He played. He played like video games, uh, Skyrim stuff like that. Um, he played board games and card games, but never played a, 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 a you know, roll the dice tabletop role-playing game and uh you know uh he took right to it his play style was a little strange uh you know uh rolling persuasion checks to try to talk fellow party members into uh ending it because it just wasn't worth going on after they'd taken some damage um but i mean that's part of the fun and and when you're doing these play tests you never know what you're going to run into um i've been really lucky i feel a lot of the play tests i i've done and my play tests are a little bit different than most people's. Like I know some other guys that go in to run play tests, they run them from, you know, morning, noon and night, nonstop every, you know, three or four hours. It's a new group that comes in. Right. Um, I, because of my schedule at conventions, I tend to limit it to just one, uh, you know, one sitting. So one, one game, um, the drinking dungeon is going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm doing a, uh, a live event, which, um, I, I don't know if anyone has kept up with this over the year, but every play test I've done at every convention has led into the next one. Um, so it, uh, when, when something happens at mid South con, uh, when I come to Hypericon, what happened at mid South con affects what happens at Hypericon. And, uh, and so the, uh, drinking dungeon is actually going to be like the, uh, the final chapter in this where, um, the, the players there all have to complete a goal. And if the goal doesn't happen, then the chapter ending will be way different. Uh, so basically I'm gonna have eight groups. I'll be running like one hour sessions and each group has to succeed at their task um, to, to, to make the, 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 well, I mean, any ending is a fun ending, but you know, the ending that maybe they are going for every group would have to succeed or at least figure out a way around uh, the problem at the end. Um, but I don't want to spoil any of that. So we'll talk about that after uh, the drinking dungeon and, and see how it all went. Um, can, can, I, can I ask you a quick question and, yeah. and, and, and you'll give me a, a, an honest answer. So you have a party. One of the get one of the people very strangely after detecting a trap decides screw it i'm just going to run across this trapped bridge anyway and hope i can run fast enough to i don't know outrun the trap he almost dies the other character that you mentioned he um decides he wants to persuade his own party member that it's not worth going on that he should just um end it right there he lost the role. What I want to know is if he had succeeded in that role, what would you have done? I that had to have been going through your mind, right? <laughs> what oh, if, it was. What it was. If, what if he does this? I, I was looking I was looking at the other players and seeing like I mean, because this is their story too. Um was uh the the archeon was grail gonna step in and stop it you know um 
and, and that's also, you know, I love random dice mechanics. It's actually something I realized this last weekend uh, when we had a board gaming uh, night is that I, I love a strategy game that then has something random based to it that I can't control because if it's all on me, I almost feel like it's too much pressure. Um, so we rolled it. It was random. It went in favor of the barbarian or not the barbarian, the ranger. But if the ranger had lost the role and was like, you know, made an argument on why they wouldn't kill themselves, uh, I, I would have, as the game master, figured out a way to, uh, on the fly, well, let, let, let's let see. Let's say it's happening right now. Um, he makes the roll. The ranger says, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to kill myself. Um, so then I think I, I would just ask, you know, that player, I'm like, okay, so what are you doing? Like, you're broken. You know, you're down to two hit points in the bottom of this ravine. Um, this other character just very charismatically or very, uh, you know, just basically told you it's over. Um, you know, and, and you look down and your body is broken. Um, you know, what's going through your head? And and I probably just would have driven it home, actually, that he is in really bad shape, you know? Because um, you can't fall back too much on metagaming that like, oh yeah, I'm only down to two hit points, so, you know, I'll just get healed. Well, that's right. fun, you know? Um, so I, I probably would have turned it into a story thing and I would have taken the persuasion there and actually talk to the ranger and maybe make him see exactly what a dire situation he's in. Um, and, and obviously I'll leave it up to the character, you know, the person playing on what they do because nobody wants to have their character, you know, and, and I mean, not to mention the sort of uncomfortable issues that you bring up uh, forcing a character to, to end, end stuff on a dice roll. Um, but I, I, I rely a lot, you know, there's, there's that thing of, um, players are going to have fun. Players are going to, um, some people would say would want to break the game, you know, um, uh, or, or, you know, throw gas on the fire. But I just see it all as examples of like, all right, so this is how this person's playing this character. How how do we keep go keep this story going and keep this character part of the group? You know, how do we keep it um relevant, you know? Uh, well, you know, honestly though, if it as far as story goes, you know, it, it was kind of an odd thing to me anyway when that happened, because I was thinking, I was imagining, you know, what if I say it's NPCs doesn't matter but let's let's say I'm in the real world just going around trying to persuade people to kill themselves that's going to be a hell of a of a role you know like a a 20-sided die isn't going to cut it now this is a special situation because the guy really was he started out with a good amount of hit points he was down to what one or two um in one fall that guy was seriously uh, injured and, and, and an argument could be made that, you know, look, you're putting the rest of us in danger. Um, so it is a little different, but, but just the idea of trying to persuade anybody to end it in that way seems like it would take a, 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 a hell of a role. Oh, but, yeah. but, but, but there's, that, that's the way I was looking at it is if the guy wants to try it, just for role playing purposes, why not? You know, why not let him give it a shot? But, but I was hoping that it didn't end with, you know, well, you have no choice. You have to. That's it. You gotta. You have to kill oh, yeah. I'd, I'd never do that. Um, I, I would just, you know, just like I feel rules are suggestions. Sometimes the dice rolls are suggestions too. You know, like. Um, you don't want to ruin anyone's fun on the dice roll, unless if that, like if that's a session that you've set up, like if you're playing uh, a more hardcore game, or you know, actually, uh, when you're setting up these these play tests, you're playing with basically a group of people that have never been together and they have no reason to be together. Um, and that's sort of what I think we're running into is, you know, you sit down at a convention to run a game. A lot of times, no one at the table knows each other. 
And so it's sort of easy to take that mercenary um, point of view, you know, like, oh, let's, uh, let's just, you know, be crazy, take all the gold for myself. Um, when you're playing with a group of people, um, and I just started doing this because uh, I was listening to another podcast that talked about zero sessions. And um, in the past, a long time ago, when me and you played and we were younger, uh, we were doing zero sessions, which is a session to make your character um, with the group. Instead of everyone showing up with a character sheet and you have a bunch of characters that aren't involved, uh, the zero session allows you to create characters and sort of find connections. Um, so we did that a lot. And um, because I mainly played with close friends, I assumed that everyone sort of did that. And then as I expanded out my gaming, uh, especially in the last couple of years, I realized, oh, wow, if you don't have reasons for people to hang out in a game, there can be some really like awkward combinations. Like why would this witch hunter be hanging out with two elven mages in this world that dislikes elves and mages, you know? Um, and, and I think with a good zero session, you can actually solve a lot of those problems. Um, in the, the last playtest group that I started, um, we had a witch hunter, um, and when I say witch hunter, it's a character class, so it's not really a witch hunter, but they have abilities to stop magic. Um, we had uh, uh, an Archeon is what we call them. So the Archeon, which was sort of the witch hunter, uh, we had a, a human druid type character, and then an elf, um, like wild magic user. And uh, uh, it was like, all right, so we got some really tough decisions here. Why are these people getting together? And um, the one thing that we do uh, in, in uh, the, the Sagaborn world is we have the, the Wanderers, which is the Adventurers Guild. And that allows us to bring people in uh, and, and sort of throw them together. So I, I, the elf was a um, an elf that had just fallen through from the Never, which is a different plane of existence. Um, and the guildmaster of the wanderers in the city is concerned with helping out magic users, making sure that these uh, prejudices against uh, the fae and magic users uh, like don't end up with a bunch of people in stocks or being, you know, uh, uh, drowned in the river. So he took this elf under his protective arm and basically put him in this group. Um, and and uh, the the witch hunter ended up making up a new sort of character group that protects mages not hunts them or anything and he's actually the protector of uh of the druids so uh we went from like three people that probably would never be together to three people that had this sort of story you know like basically the the guild master put the elf in with these guys to train him how to use magic in the current world um and so Obviously, when you have a, a convention, if you allow people to roll up their own characters or, or just play with any personality, you're going to have, you know, sort of wild things happen because you just don't have time to do that, you know, character building. Um, but it's also interesting, I mean, with, with you on the fiction side, um, I, I haven't written enough of a novel to say that I could answer this question. But I've heard other people who write things say that a character can pop up in the writing and they didn't quite expect the character there and they didn't expect that personality. Obviously, it's not as blatant as someone who shows up at a playtest trying to talk the characters into, uh, you know, ending it. Um, but have you experienced that at all in the, the Crossroads book? Yeah. The, most of the characters that I have were in my mind from the beginning, most of them. Uh, there was one who uh, I decided that this person needs a companion. And then I started telling that companion story and it became so interesting to me that that companion became one of the major uh, uh, characters later on. Uh, what, hap what seems to happen more often for me is a character that already exists really goes in a di direction I didn't expect. And I don't, 
I can't, I can't say that I understand this process. There's a sort of organic process that where the, the story does take a life of its own and the characters take a life of their own. And as much as you try to wrangle them back into just like I imagine, yeah, with uh, playing with other people, you realize that, you know, this, you, once you get in the head of the, this character, you realize that their trajectory is just, you know, that maybe what you had in mind, this simple little bit in the story doesn't make sense anymore because every character has their own motivations, their own impulses, uh, their own desires and fears. And you have to let them be who they are. Uh, and that's the only way to, I, I think, avoid having one dimensional characters. It's probably a lot easier for people who are, you know, there's that whole debate that goes on with writers, um, the, 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 the plotting versus pantsing. And I, I fall somewhere in the middle, but I think if you, and, and, and I'm not saying this to disparage plotters out there, but there are books that I read where, I, where I'm, I'm so impressed by the, the, the intricacies of the plot that I can't help but love the story. But the characters feel a lot of times one dimensional. And I think that's a symptom of being too rigid in the plotting because you've plotted before you've had a chance to explore all of these characters. You explore the characters in the writing. It's, it's through the writing that you start to, you know, that you learn how do they talk, how do they, and there's no amount of note taking at the beginning that's going to, that's going to solve all of that. And you have to, you have to be willing to change the story in order to let the characters be who they are. Uh, by the, does that answer? I, I'm, I hope I'm answering the right question. I hope I understood the question properly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, um, you know, I, there's a, a quote that Tolkien, uh, said, and I think it was in one of his letters where, uh, when Frodo looked across the bar and saw Strider for the first time, uh, Tolkien didn't even know who he was. Um, you know, and, and I mean, I think that happens. I mean, you know, the, the honest truth is, um, we, you can't create a whole world and have everything planned out ahead of time. Even if you have a team of people, um, you, you start with the idea, you run with it. You're going to run into things that, that make it more complicated or, uh, even maybe change the story, you know, earlier on. Um, I think we're, we've reached a point now, um, in, in media where stuff comes out so quickly that people are getting used to it. Um, you know, like there's, uh, and as long as the story is good enough, you can almost put up with it. Uh, not almost put up with it. You can put up with it. Um, you know, I, I guess I'm thinking of a lot of TV series, uh, but I'm also thinking for us, uh, having the small team that we have uh, and not having it our full-time job, we're going to come up with ideas later that are better, and we're not going to just always rewrite the world. But there's sometimes we have to sort of say, okay, well, we didn't see this problem arising. And so, you know, this thing that happened earlier on is, is maybe not as true as we thought it was. Um, and, and I think me and you have dealt a lot with that, with doing things through the perspective of one person. Um, me and you feel very comfortable. I think me and both of us feel very uncomfortable with absolutes, with saying, this is the way the world is. Um, yes. Because I know that me and you have really different views on just sort of how we take, we've taken in the world up to our current, you know, point. I mean, it, it, you know, our, uh, what is it that you, you, you always say about, uh, like, with perception and reality, don't you have a quote about that, about your reality being created by your perception or? Uh, you might mean the, the, the course, the Alfred Korzybski 
uh, saying of uh, the map is not the territory, uh, which has been put a number of ways. Is that what you mean? Something like that. It might just be that in general. Uh, 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 Alan Watts said the, the, the menu is not the meal. What we, we, tend to, we tend to think that our perception of reality is reality. But it's just the map. It's 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 a tool for us to understand and to help us navigate, and we and we forget that sometimes, and that's why we we have such absolutes, and we think that uh, my opinion is the right opinion. Uh, no, you came to your opinion because of the um, uh, series of events and perceptions that you had throughout your life, uh, which is very narrow. Um, and, and, and limited by your senses. So yeah, when, I, when I'm thinking of, uh, of, of fiction and of world building, I'm always thinking this is a different world to, you know, in the real world we have seven, seven what's it up to, seven and a half billion people in the world now. That's seven and a half billion different worldviews. That's seven and a half different worlds essentially because nobody's experiencing the same world. No two people are. And so you can, you'll, never, you'll never write a world from all of those perspectives uh, because that would be impossible. But you have to factor that in, that the world looks very different to different people, um, to different cultures, and from one person to the next. Well, I think that's the cool thing about role playing is that you actually get to sort of build that world and then have as many people as possible uh, play in that world and sort of write their own stories in it, you know. Um, right. Well, and that, that's an interesting thing, too, because I was going to say a minute ago that when I was talking about fiction and how it, a lot of these things take a life of their own and there's no way to stick to a rigid plot, uh, for me at least, that is partly because, well, fundamentally it's because the ideas never stop. Just because I wrote the plot, that's just the beginning part. Now I'm writing, but I'm still getting ideas. And sometimes those ideas are too good to not use or they, you know, and they might conflict and whether it's a character or otherwise. What I was going to say though is you, you, you add in world building like we're doing and that's a whole other level because you and I might be having a discussion about an entire culture that, you know, we, we'll never, we'll never we'll never write every culture in the world and even a culture has subcultures it has countercultures it you know so even talking about a culture gets complex we'll never cover it all the more we do cover the richer the world becomes and that's great um and and that's the process but every time either one of us comes up with an idea we have to fit it in now and it affects other things maybe it affects things we've already written um but then you add in doing, building a world where players get to have their own creative agency in the world uh, to a limited degree, sure. But it's like you mentioned about the protectorate. That was a player. And now the protectorate is a part of our world. And it's something we hadn't accounted for. So now we have to think about their role in the world, where do they fit in? And, it, and again, it makes the world richer. And the more of these ideas we have, the, the richer it's gonna get. Um, but we can never be too certain about, about what the world is. Yeah, there well, always has to be some flexibility. Um, I, I almost uh, like the idea of, well, I mean, I do like the idea of, you know, this so overarching feel for the world and then um, these sort of uh, pockets of definition. Um, for example, uh, our other writer, Sean, is very attracted to Fairy Fort. That's where we were writing uh, before. Um, it's a city in the West. And uh, that is starting to get very defined right now. And he enjoys writing in that area. Like it's that to him, I, I think it, it calls to his tendencies as a writer. Um, but I don't want to go over 50 miles to the next city and define that as well, unless we need it. You know, um, I don't want to go up to the far north and define that until that's completely needed for a story 
Because the other thing that that does is that cuts off any player or or other writers because we're we're being very collaborative with this writing. Um, as people come in, they're showing interest. We we sort of allow them to have their own little pocket of definition, you know, uh, and, and they they wouldn't be able to do that if we tried to write a whole uh, world book. And even if we did write a whole world book, we'd be, you know, going over stuff with such a broad stroke that I don't think it would matter anyways. Right. Um, a, a funny story about uh, perception uh, that happened at Liberty Const, jumping back to what we were talking earlier, is uh, hosting the dance party on Friday night, I looked out and there was more people sitting in the back on their cell phones than I have ever seen at any of the dance parties I've ever hosted at a convention. And I was like, oh man, I'm just not playing the right music. And I was stressing, stressing and like trying to find the perfect mix and get people off the, off the wall. And it just didn't happen. And so I sort of felt like, you know, I mean, I felt it was a good time, but I was like, I just didn't get enough people excited about it. And then the next day, so that was my perception. The next day, person after person came up to me and they're like oh we love the dance party like we just hung out in there and just played on our phones uh and i'm not blaming pokemon go for this but they were just playing on their phone and it just happened to come out that weekend um and, and so to them they're having a good time just being in there with the energy and listening to the music um but if i hadn't talked to them i would have went home thinking i failed hosting that party and they would have went home thinking that was a great party that they were at and and if that's just 50 people in a room, you know, what is it when you go up to the state level or the, you know, country level, so on. So. Right. No, that, that's exactly right. In fact, the, the idea of the, of, of Alfred Korzybski is he was a, a colleague of, um, of, of, of Freud's and, uh, you know, personally, I think Korzybski was a little more, uh, accurate in his understanding of, of the human mind. Freud, uh, is, a lot less relevant these days, even though Korzybski's not very well known. But um, but he was when he said that it was he was coming from a psychological perspective. And so if you're dealing with neuroses or you know you, you feel down on yourself or and you part of the problem he realized is people had these absolute thoughts. Uh, you know this party is a failure, and uh, his solution to almost all. Uh, psychoses was uh one of his students called it e prime which was english prime and it's basically the english language without the word is uh without the word uh is of identity so uh if you're talking about uh you know somebody cuts you off on in traffic you say oh that guy is an asshole well no that guy seems to be in a hurry you know or that um if, if you if you take out the word is then all of those absolutes go away and 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 uh uh and that's in his in his his theory was that would be if we could get people to think in that way it would be the end of violence because people don't fight over maybes you know you, you take any war and you have two sides that are damn sure about their own belief system and um uh, or else they wouldn't go killing people over it. So, uh, you know, so you, you replace is with seems to be or um, or even more seems to be right now because people change, people go through moods. So uh, if you're in a party, no two people see it the same way, but we always get in our own heads. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, we have the negativity bias. We look for evidence of negativity and that's no that's not a that's not a, a a problem with any one person that's you know all of us have that tendency well i i wonder um so so to bring that back around to to the writing a little bit um the like defining stuff um we you know, you used to watch a movie once in the theater and then you went home and you had memories of it. Now we watch a movie 200 times on DVD. Um, we used to get together and have fan theories about Star Wars. Now uh, the, the holocron online has everything. So much so that they've now had to divide it up into 
stuff that's legends that doesn't affect the new canon universe and uh you know you, what what is now considered canon or back in the day with star trek people would meet at conventions people would go to conventions to talk about the stuff but there wasn't a definitive answer to a lot of stuff i mean you could pull up references but like even you know without the internet how much could people really put this whole world of knowledge into one place and now we can um so the good side of that is that we get to um for our writing we get to have a wikipedia ourselves it's very easy to navigate um, and we keep adding more data to it that allows us to create a richer world but at the same time it means that if one of our books mentions like the 30th lord of sea haven and it's not the exact same 30th lord of sea haven that's in the wikipedia then it's considered wrong you know um right. and uh we're just getting to that point now where everything is so easily searchable and defined um that that uh uh it sort of takes some of the fun out of it i think Um, well, you know, you mentioned a little while ago, Sean writing in Fairyport and, and it's a very defined area and you and I have already sort of, we've started exploring the Eastlands because that's an area that we hadn't given much thought to. Um, I think that's, I think that's our nature, the two of us to, we like to, we like the part where it's free and open and we can just let our minds roam wherever they may. And then the, as it starts to get more and more defined, we're ready to move on to the next thing. It's something I've had to rein in, you know, because you, you never get, if you, if you stay in that state of mind, you never get anything done. But that is my natural state of mind. Um, so I, I, I guess the point is I agree, but there's still a lot of world to figure out. And there always will be, like I said before. Um, and honestly, I... If there's an occasional contradiction, um, you know, like my novel, I, I I wrote it as a person telling a story. If my novel ends up having some contradictions, it's just an unreliable storyteller. You know, they can say it's wrong, but maybe he had a reason for telling it that way. Because that's another thing I put into it is that he's telling this story to uh, for a, for a reason. So, so maybe you can't trust every little detail. Now, I'm not doing the totally unreliable storyteller. It's not that he's making up a fiction, but, um, but, uh, <laughs> but I guess I have an out there. If somebody calls me on it and says, "Hey, wait a minute, your Wikipedia says your wiki says this," well, do you trust the wiki or do you trust the storyteller? Yeah, and I mean. I, only with details by the way obviously we have to have some consistency when it comes to the big picture right right and and i mean i think this goes back to to us being like you know indie writers uh we just don't have the manpower to check for stuff like that in fact uh well, i'm sorry but real quick also we're not we're not writing about a world with an internet so if there's a storyteller or somebody has a book of lore that has a bunch of creatures in it uh well you even with the internet you see how much nonsense gets out there so the storyteller might not be even telling a lie but that's you know maybe people in fairyport believe that the 30th warlord of such and such a place was this but if one of them were to travel to the library of that of that town they would learn otherwise so it only works within fiction though within the with the gaming side i guess there's a little you it requires a little more consistency and accuracy right well or you know if you mentioned an inn that was 10 miles out of a town and they go back through that town and you mentioned another inn that happens to be in that same area sure there could be two inns you know there, there is i mean it just as you add no matter what you have to start cross-checking so much stuff um and uh it looks like we're we're almost out of time so i'll sort of end it on a funny story and then let you wrap up but uh talking about cross-checking um sean emailed me last night and he said mike uh the red magic crystal that tane was supposed to give the players in the second adventure book the second published adventure book 
did he ever give it to them? Because I can't find mention of it anywhere. And so I started searching and searching through the adventure book, you know, a hundred plus page adventure book. And there's one mention of it that Tane tells the players to find him at the inn, sitting at a table with a red stone on the table. Nowhere else is it mentioned. We wrote all this backstory of what this red stone could do. And it would allow the players to talk to Tane across distances, like once per day. Um, we did a props package that came for our Kickstarter backers that came with a red crystal in it for the props backers. Um, so we wrote all this history, and I'm not sure even where that disappeared to. Uh, there's a slight mention of it in the book, and then it came in the props package, which I'm sure the backers were like, what does this red crystal have to do with anything in this book? And, and Don had been writing his book, assuming that the players did have this ability to talk with Tane, and there's no mention of it. So it's like it, it's like all of a sudden this red stone just appeared in their pockets as if someone mailed it to them or something. Uh, and, and uh, you know, he, he had to go back and edit the beginning of his story. But even something small like that, you know, you just get it in your head and you think it's all laid out in there and actually it just, you know, it, it disappeared in the wind somewhere. Yeah. But uh, so as we wrap up, uh, our first episode. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to, to touch base on, or? Uh, no. Uh, we had a, a few things that I was hoping to talk about, and we, uh, I expected we would run out of time. We can cover those things next time. Great. Yeah, we'll just add it to our list. So, uh, thank you for anyone that watched our first uh, webcast, and uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Keep All right. adventuring.